Hello, I am going to do a little history lesson for you about socialism in the ancient past. And this recording, this footage is from MK Ice and Fire, who does gameplay videos. And this is a called Assassin's Creed Origins, which takes place around the Protomy Egypt, which at the time, this is where Egypt was the most technologically advanced ever in ancient times. This is why at its peak, technologically speaking, and coincidentally speaking, this is where they became socialists. So, how did socialism under Ptolemy Egypt function? Well, this is not the first time where socialism was implemented during ancient times. We have multiple examples of anarchism, communism, and socialism throughout the Bronze Age and the Silver Age and during the late antiquity. So, uh, but the Ptolemy Egypt one is basically the last time until Christianity rise to prominence that we have socialism on a on a scale of a nation, which in this case the Ptolemy Egypt. By far, the most interesting aspect of the Ptolemaic Egypt is an extensive experiment in state socialism. Royal ownership of the land had long been a sacred custom in Egypt. The pharaoh, as king and god, had full right to the soil and all that it produced. The fellow was not a slave, but he could not leave his place without the permission of the government. He was required to do over the larger part of his crop to the state. The Ptolemies accepted this system, extended by the appropriating the great tracts which under previous dynasty had belonged to Egyptian nobles or priests. A great bureaucracy of government overseas supported by armed guards managed all Egypt as a vast state farm. Nearly every peasant in Egypt was told by these officials what soil to till and what crops to grow. His labor and his animals could at any moment be requisitioned by the state for mining, building, hunting, and the making of canals or rolls. His harvest was guarded by the state measures registered by the scribes, treasures of the royal treasury floor, and covering by the living chain of fellas into the granaries of the king. There were exceptions to the system. The Ptolemies allowed the farmer to own his house and garden. They resigned the city to private property, and they gave a right of leasehold to soldiers whose service were rewarded by land, but this leasehold was usually confined to areas with the owner agreed to devote the vineyards, orchards, or olive groves. It excludes the power of piquets and might at any time be concealed by the kings as Greek energy and still provide these clear rich or shareholder lands. It demand arose for the right to transmit the property from father to son. In the second century, such uh, piquets was permitted by custom, but not by law. In the last century before Christ, it was recognized by law and the usual evolution from common property to private property was completed. Doubtless this system of socialism had been involved because of the condition of tillage in Egypt required more cooperation, more unison of action in time and space than individual ownership could be expected to provide. The amount and character of the crops to be sold depend upon the extent of the annual inundation and the efficiency of irrigation and drainage. These matters are actually made for central control. Greek engineers in the employ of the government improved the ancient processes and applied a more scientific and intense agriculture to the land. The ancient Shetov was replaced by the Noria, a large wheel sometimes 40 feet in diameter, equipped with the buckets hanging freely in the interior rim. At the top of the revolution, each bucket was tilted by the obstruction bar and emptied its constant into irrigation reservoir. Better still, the screw of Archimedes and the pub of Decibidius raised water with a speed unknown before the Ptolemies. The centralization of economic management in the hands of the government and the institution of forced labor made possible great public works of flood control, road construction, irrigation, and building, and prepared the way for the engineering feats of Rome. Ptolemy II drained Lake Moresin and turned its bed into a great track of fertile land for distribution among the soldiers. In 285, he began to restore the canal from the Nile near Heliopolis to the Red Sea near Sus. Pharaoh Neco and Darius I had built and rebuilt this, but twice the shifty sand had choked it up as a century they would do again. Industry operated under similar conditions, the government not only owned the mines, but either worked them themselves or appropriating the ore. The Ptolemies opened up available gold deposits in Nubia and had a stable gold coinage. They controlled the copper mines of Cyprus and Sinai. They have a monopoly of oil derived not from the soil but from plants like lensi, croton, and sesame. 
The government fixed each year the amount of land to be sold to such plants. It took the whole product at its own price. It extracted oil in state factories through great bean presses worked by serfs. It sold to oil to retail at its own price and its grew foreign competition by the heavy tariff. Its profit ranged from 17 to 300 percent. Apparently, there were several government subsidies in salt, nitro, carbonate of salt that uses soap, incense, papyrus and textiles. There were some private textile factories, but they had to sell all their products to the state. A minor industry were left at the, in private hands. The state merely licensed and supervised them, brought a large share of their output at fixed prices as state, and taxed a good part of the profit into the royal treasury. Handicrafts were carried on by Asian guilds whose members were by tradition bound to their trade, their village, even to their domicile. Industry was well developed, chariots, furniture, terracotta carpets, and cosmetics were produced in abundance. Glass blowing and the weaving and lining were Alexandria's specialties. Invention was more advanced in Protobe Egypt than any economy before Imperial Rome. The screw chain, the wheel chain, the cam chain, the ratchet chain, the poly chain, and the screw press were all in use, and th and the chemistry of dyes had progressed to the point of treating cloths with diverse richness, which brought forth from immersion in one time a variety of fast colors. In general, factories at Alexandria were worked by slaves, whose low cost of maintenance enabled the protomy to undersell in foreign trade the product of Greek handicraft. All commerce were controlled and regulated by the government. Retail traders were usually state agents distribute state goods. All caravan routes and waterways were owned by the state. Protomy II introduced the camel into Egypt, and they organized a camel post to the south. This carried only governmental communication, but this included nearly all commercial correspondence to the country. The Nile was busy with passengers and freight traffic, apparently under private management, subject to state regulation. For the Mediterranean trade, the Protomies built the largest commercial fleet of the time, with vessels of 300 tons burden. A warehouse at the St. Vite World Trade, its double harbor was envy of other cities, its lighthouse was one of the seven wonders. The fields, factories, and workshops of Egypt supply a great surplus, which found markets as far east as China, as far south as Central Africa, as far north as Russia and the British Isles. Egyptian explorers sailed down to the Zanzibar and Somaliland and told the world about the troglodytes who live along the East African coast and seafood, ostriches, and carrots and roots. To break the Arab hold on India trade with Near East, Egyptian ships sailed directly from the Nile to India under the wise encouragement of the Protemis Alexandria became the leading port of regiment for Eastern merchandise destined to the market of the Mediterranean. This flooring of commerce and industry was quickened by excellent banking conveniences. Payment in kind survived to some degree as a legacy from ancient Egypt, and the grain of royal treasury was used part of the bank reserve, but the deposit withdrawal and transfer of grain might be on a paper instead of being physically formed. Beside this modifier border rose a complex money economy. Banking was a government monopoly, but its operation might be delegated to private firms. If the bills were paid by traps of bank balances, banks lent money at interest and paid to account of the royal treasury. The central bank at Alexandria had branches in all the important towns. Never in no history had agriculture, industry, commerce, and finance reached so rich, so unified, and so brutal a development. The masters and beneficiaries of this system were the free Greeks of the capital, and the head of all was the pharaoh god king. From the viewpoint of the Greek population, the Protodemy was truly a soldier or savior, a Eucritis or benefactor. He gave them 100,000 places in the bureaucracy, endless economic opportunity, unprecedented facilities for the life of the mind, and the wealthy court as sort as a center of luxurious social life. Nor was the king an incalculable despot. Egyptian tradition combined with the Greek law to build up a system of legislation which borrowed from and improved upon the Athenian code in every aspect except freedom. The ethics of the king have full legal force, but the cities enjoy considerable self-government and the Egyptian, Greek, and Jewish population live each under its own system of law, chose its own magistrate, and plead before its own court. A third papyrus gave us the record of the Alexandria lawsuit, the issue are precisely defined, the evidence is carefully presented, precedent are summarized, and the final judgment is given with judicial impartiality. 
other papyri preserved Alexandria wills and revealed the antiquity of legal forms. This is the will of Pelisioth Delicia, son of X, of sound mind and deliberate intention. That's one example. The Plotiamic was the most efficient organized government in Hellenistic world. It took its natural form from Egypt of Persia, its municipal form from Greece and passed them on to Imperial Rome. The country was divided into nomes or provinces, each administrated by a appointed of the king. Nearly all these officials were Greek. The idea of Alexander, that Greek or Oriental or Egyptian, should live and mingle on equal terms was forgotten as unlucrative. The valley of the Nile became frankly a conquered land. The Greek overseas brought an advanced technology and management to the economic life of Egypt and enormously expanded the wealth of the nation, but they took the increase. The state charged high price for the product which is control and buried competition with the tariff. Wall, hence olive oil that cost 21 drachmas, in Talos cost 52 in Alexandria. Everywhere, the government took rentals, taxes, customs, and tolls, sometimes labor and life itself. The peasants pay a fee to the state, the right to keep cattle, for the fodder and to fed them, for the privilege of grazing them on the common pasture land. The private owner of these vineyards or orchards pay a six. On the Protomy II, a half of this produce to the state. All persons except soldiers, priests, and government officials pay a poll tax. There were taxes on salt, legal documents, and beckets, a 5% tax on rentals, a 10% tax on sales, a 25% levy on all fish caught in Egyptian waters, a toll on goods passing from village to town or along the Nile. There were high experts as well as important duties at all Egyptian ports. There were special taxes to maintain the fleet of the lighthouse, to keep the municipal physicians and police in good humor, and to buy a gold crown for every new king. Nothing was overlooked that could fatten the state to keep track of all taxable products, income, and transactions, and the government maintained a swarm of scribes, a fast system of personal and property registration to collect the taxes and farm them out to specialized supervisor operation and held their possession and security till the return were in the total revenue of the Plotomies. In money and kind, it was probably the greatest gathering by any government between the fall of Persia and the accession of Rome. And this is one of the examples of a socialism in ancient times before the rise of Christianity. And it's considered and Plotomy Egypt was considered by Egyptian history at its most peak technologically speaking, and the most advanced and wealthiest in the entire Mediterranean world at the time. And it shows you that socialism, regardless of what time period, regardless if it's the hierarchical authoritarian dictator status version of socialism, which I do not even consider as social, it's no different than state capitalism in many cases, but because capitalism did not exist at that time, this is like the only example of legit state socialism we have. And this is one example of socialism, regardless which version, work.